Good morning, New Beginnings. It's me, Pastor Danish House. Today is Wednesday, July 17th, 2024. Thank you so much for joining me for this daily update and devotional video. I'm glad you decided to make me part of your life today, and I'm delighted that you're part of my life as well. Well, today is Mike and Jean DeCarmine's anniversary. Happy anniversary, Mike and Jean. We love you guys so much. Pray that you are blessed by God today and that you get to enjoy uh, this celebration of your relationship. Um, hope that you will have a wonderful, wonderful day. Uh, we love you guys and are grateful that you're part of our fellowship. Today also, uh, no, that's it. That's my only thing today. So yeah, uh, that's what's going on today. Um, on Sunday, I preached out of Exodus 7, 8, 9, and 10. Uh, and one of the points that I made, and again, I was, I was sort of summarizing the theology of these chapters. These are the chapters that teach about the 10 plagues or the 10 uh, strikes that God launched against uh, Egypt in, uh, in response to 400 years of forced slavery that, they, that the Egyptians had uh, enforced against God's people, the people of Israel. And um, so we actually, we only talked about the first nine plagues or the first nine strikes. Um, but uh, it's such a long passage that I couldn't go into detail on all of those plagues or all those strikes, but we talked about sort of what is the overarching theology. And as I mentioned on Monday in the daily devotional video, one of the things that the passage is teaching is that there is only one God and Yahweh is, is God of all, that Yahweh is the God over all the earth. And that's something that Yahweh God wanted to make clear to Pharaoh, to the Egyptians, to uh, all the world for all generations to come. Okay, And yesterday we talked about how um, not only does he want uh, for, for everyone to know that he is God, God wants everybody to know that um, there is chaos that results from disobedience to his commands. There's chaos that results in the world around us. The world turns to chaos when we disobey God's commands. And again, I hope that you're, you went back and read those passages and, and saw the same things that I was pointing out. The third theological point that I think this passage is trying to make is a, a point about um, God's judgment on sin. That when we sin, it invites God's judgment, that God cannot leave sin unpunished. Now, uh, God does leave sin unpunished at times uh, over the course of a, a lifetime, right? So that, but, there, but there are times when God steps in and directly brings his judgment on sin during our time on earth, okay? Typically, God reserves his judgment now until uh, the resurrection, but this is one instance of God demonstrating his judgment against sin. And, you know, with good reason. Um, the enslaving of an entire nation for almost 400 years is a crime so monstrous that there's no human justice that can really make it right. right? We talked about this on Sunday. How, if, if, if I go and I steal a book from the bookstore and I get caught, um, there, is, there are ways for me to make restitution for that theft, right? I give the book back. I pay for the book. I, I make restitution for their loss of, of time and resources in trying to prosecute the crime. Maybe I pay uh, twice the price of the book or three times the price of the book. Maybe I do a little jail time for my theft, right? Um, there are ways to repay the person I've stolen from and to repay society for the chaos that I've created through my theft, right? Um, if I lie about someone, well, that's a little trickier, right? If I lie about someone publicly, I can uh, confess and repent for my sin of, of lying about someone. I can uh, tell the truth about that person and try to undo the, the, the wrong that I've done. One of the things that we've seen, I think, over the years, and if you've had any experience with, with uh, slander, is that once you tell a lie, it's difficult to unring that bell, right? 
Um, and especially if you tell that lie publicly, if you tell that uh, lie prominently, it's difficult to unring a bell, even though you might try to make it right later. I remember uh, back in the 1980s when there was the bombing at the uh, Winter Olympics and uh, the news media uh, immediately focused on a fellow named Richard Jewell as the perpetrator of this bombing. Um, it was a bomb that was in a backpack that was put in a, I think, in a garbage uh, trash receptacle. And Jewell was a uh, was the uh, security guard who found the bomb and and phoned it in. And the news media focused in on Richard Jewell, saying that he had put the bomb there himself and reported it as a way of getting attention to himself. Well, that later was shown to be absolutely incorrect. Richard Jewell was working at great cost to his his own risk, to his own life, to uh, isolate that bomb and to and to report it. Um, he was completely innocent of that charge, but uh, for the remainder of his life, he was dogged by people who. Uh, even though it was later found that he was innocent of those charges and it was loudly uh, tr uh, pr proclaimed in the media that he was uh, innocent of those charges, um, the, the, the defense, his defense, didn't make it nearly as far as the accusations. And so he had lost his reputation and uh, he wasn't able to get a job because of, of fears that people had about employing him. And uh, he wound up taking his own life. And one of the things that he had said prior to taking his own life was, where do I go to get my reputation back? Right? Uh, and, you know, I would ask, what price did the media members pay for reporting on untrue allegations? Nothing, right? Uh, there, what could be done? What could be done to make it right to Richard Jewell? You know, human justice has limitations, and especially when it comes to mass crimes, like the enslavement of an entire nation of people for almost 400 years. And so God himself brings judgment on the Egyptians as a form of his judgment against sin. Now, in yesterday's video, I talked about the chaos that results from our sin. And one of the bits that we may not have noticed during that in that passage is out of Romans chapter uh, one, it says this, it's talking about all the chaos that comes from uh, disobedience to God's command, right? Uh, evil, covetousness, malice, right? Envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossips, slander, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, right? All the chaos that comes from disobedience to God's command. But then we, that little bit that comes next is often easy to slide over. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. The, the consequence, when we do these evil things that create chaos in society, God's judgment is that our sin uh, is worthy of death. In fact, it says this in Romans chapter 6, verses 21 to 23. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's not just uh, massive genocidal crimes that deserve God's judgment. It's also the, the sins that you and I commit. Uh, remember, in Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is uh, weighing against the, um, the sins and crimes of irreligious people. But then in Romans chapter 2, he turns the tables and says, but you religious people, you who claim to follow God, you do the same thing. So, you know, it's really easy for us as Christians to say, well, you know, those who do such things, those who do these bad things, right, they deserve to die. The, the wages of sin is death for them, for sure, right? They, oh yeah, they're gossip. Oh yeah, they're covet. Oh yeah, they're doing sexual sin, right? Unrighteousness. Uh, they they reject God. They are this. They deserve 
God's punishment. They deserve death. But the Apostle Paul's judgment is that it's not just the irreligious who deserve God's wrath, but it's you and me. Religious people, right? Uh, people who claim to follow God, but yet disobey God in our daily lives. We deserve death. The wages of your sin is death. The wages of my sin is death. This is the, the, the bottom line when it comes to a Christian understanding of sin, is that our sin is a crime that deserves death. And, you know, the thing about the death penalty is once you've, uh, once you've applied the death penalty, once you've uh, have exercised the death penalty, that's it, right? There's, there's no more learning from that. Um, if you or if I had to pay for our sins through our death, it would be just, but where would we go from there? God's ultimate goal, now God is the judge of the living and the dead. God will judge in righteousness, but judgment is not God's ultimate goal. God's ultimate goal is to create for himself a people uh, of righteousness. So God's goal for you is not to judge you. God's judgment is something that will happen. But God's goal is not to judge people. It's not what God wants to have happen. What God wants to have happen is to create a people who will live in obedience to him. And so the death penalty, while just, is not God's objective. God's objective is the creation of a new people. And that's why in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He's been talking here about fruit, right? You get no fruit from your evil deeds. The only fruit you get is death. But when you get set free from sin, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life, right? That's the fruit that God wants. God doesn't want the fruit that leads to death. God wants to see the fruit that leads to life. He wants to give the free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so we have, a, we have that, that turning point, right? The, our sins deserve death, but death is not what God wants for us. What God wants is eternal life, sanctification, righteousness. He wants the fruit of a life well lived. What makes the change? If our sins deserve death, God is just. He will uh, you know, not let sin go unpunished, but what he, doesn't, he doesn't want the death penalty to be applied to us. So what does God do? Well, that's the point, right? Is that in Jesus Christ, our Lord, God comes into this world to pay the price for our sins. In order to get the end that he wants and to remain just, God comes into this world and pays the price for our sins so that we don't receive the punishment for our sins, but he takes it on himself. And he gives to us in exchange for our sins. He gives us the gift of eternal life. He gives us a life that results in a fruit that will last, the fruit of eternal life, the fruit of joy, the fruit of peace. That's the exchange that God makes. In, in contrast to the chaos that comes from our sin, the fruit of God's uh, work in our lives is a harvest of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. This is the exchange that God makes, and it's, it's a powerful and a beautiful exchange. And it only happens through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We have to put our faith in him to allow that gift to be applied to our account, right? Uh, someone asked, you know, uh, if, if God is good, why is there so much evil in the world? And, you know, one response to that is that if, if soap exists, why are there so many dirty people in the world, right? Soap doesn't do any good if you don't apply it to yourself. Um, Jesus is there to bring about um, a change in your life, but Jesus won't force it on you. 
you got to apply Jesus to your life. Allow him to forgive your sins and take your guilt away. And allow him to start you on the path to walking in righteousness, joy, and peace. That's the fruit that God deserves and desires for our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that in your love for us, you, you desire for us not death, but life. And that you give us a way to experience that life rather than the chaos of a life lived apart from you. Help us to trust in Jesus and his salvation for uh, the complete transformation and recreation of our lives. Lord, I pray for every person within the sound of my voice that they would know that there is forgiveness from sin, forgiveness from guilt, liberation from guilt, uh, and a life lived with you that results in the fruit that uh, is worth having in our lives. Lord, I pray that you allow every person within the sound of my voice to trust in you for that salvation. I lift up uh, Mike and Jean to Carmine today on their anniversary. May they be blessed. Thank you so much for the privilege of knowing them and having them as part of our fellowship. Please bless them today. It's always wonderful. I love seeing their photos from their uh, anniversary dinners every time uh, they have their anniversary. You get to see them uh, go out to dinner and, and take photos of it and share with their Facebook friends. That's just a highlight for me. And I look, look forward to seeing those pictures today and, and celebrating with them. Uh, the joy of their anniversary. Please bless them in every way, in Jesus' name. And bless everybody within the sound of my voice. May they hear your voice, your voice, and do your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining me for this daily update and devotional video. I love you, New Beginnings, and I look forward to talking to you again tomorrow.